his, uh, they have given up on behavior as a function of the setting and what has happened in the past to talk about verbal behavior. You describe settings and you ask them to say what they would, in, would expect to happen, what would they would intend to do, and so on. Now, I think that is a, that's moving right into the field of verbal behavior and forgetting all about what the Alpine people study, which is real situations and real behavior. And that reminds me now, of you are giving me a free reign here, of a very, another very important point. Many people, especially the animal activists now, are saying, you can do all of these experiments with human beings, why do you have to use animals? My answer to that is absolutely the opposite. You can't do these experiments with human beings, you must do them with animals, or with nonverbal human beings, of which you don't have many, unless you work with very small children, or very atypical people. And the reason is a situation in which people find themselves. And what happens then is that they analyze the situations and begin to say something about it. Mm -hmm. And they may give themselves rules to follow. Mm -hmm. And then what they do from that point on is a response to the setting you have created and to the rules they have created for themselves. So that there is the only research on human subjects that I think feasible is precisely that point of what people do in analyzing situations and giving themselves rules which modify their contingency-shaped behavior. And I think it's all the, basic, the basic behavioral processes are all available in the animal laboratory, all of them. And they, let's see, I use nothing but those processes in my book on verbal behavior. That is where you study it. That is, that is where you study how the brain works, if you want to put it that way, or how the organism as a whole works, as I want to put it. And given that, you can then interpret what's going on in daily life, both in terms of the contingencies which prevail as such, or the contingencies which generate verbal behavior and responses to the products of verbal behavior. I think it's a very important point. Only the animal laboratory, really, can get down to the basic processes of behavior. And that's the, the that's basic process I put that through, and I would say that was true of, uh, of perception, too. I think the work that's been done uh, Einstein's work on pattern discrimination and con what he calls concept formation, I wouldn't call it that, I think the concept's in the apparatus, not in the pigeon, but that is a much more precise study of how behavior is brought under the control of stimuli than to bring people into a setting and try to convert them into, as the old Wundtians did, into the skilled observer who didn't take the stimulus into account. That was the stimulus error. If you take what you remember about stimuli, you'll spoil the research. Of course, the perception people came along and did that too. And what you perceive, the way you perceive something is not the way it is, but the way it seems to you. And all that means is not the way it is, but the way it is, plus all of this happened to you in similar situations throughout your life. And that is why you respond to it as a perception instead of but I think you only can get you get back to the basic processes only with nonverbal organisms. And that basic is, in the sense of not contaminated by not being contaminated by talking about it or be, or having been influenced by what okay. was said to you and so on. Okay. But you're not but you're not suggesting that it isn't worthwhile once you understand the basic processes or as you're studying the basic processes, it's worthwhile to also study how people make use of verbal behavior. Oh, well, uh, you teach verbal behavior, yes. And you, uh, you teach them to follow instructions. You teach them to respond to descriptions of contingencies. You, we do this with children all the time. And we could do it much better than we do in schools if we, if we recognize the nature of the problem. You call it rules, uh, and other people might call some of what you've talked about 
um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you've said that something, then you, then you do it that way because you've said so. Well, that would be an example. I don't like the word rules, but it's what I really mean is verbal behavior control behavior, but mm -hmm. that's a little awkward. Mm -hmm. And I'm settling for rules just as a, as, a, as a standard term. There's a whole field of uh, psychological research on what's called problem solving or concept formation. You know, people are yes. shown cars with curly lines or straight lines and red borders or blue borders yes. and so on. Um, and and uh, what people do in trying to identify the critical features of yes. the stimuli is often called hypothesis making. Yes. Um, how would you talk about that? Well, uh, hypothesis is something that's supposed to be inside. And that's why I object to that, absolutely. Uh, I think that the old word association is a good, a good example. It's a very simple example. Pavlov's dogs associated the bell with the food. Not at all. Pavlov associated them. Associate means to put together. And it was Pavlov who did that. The interesting thing is that having associated <laughs> the bell with the food, the dog begins to respond to the bell. Now, that is not association by the dog. It's associated by Pavlov. The same thing is true of concept formation. Um, the various uh, Einstein's experiment, very, very fascinating experiment. You show a pigeon hundreds of slides, in some of which there are people, and in others not. And in a surprising short time, the pigeons will respond in one way to, uh, to a slide with a person in it, and another way to a slide. Without. Now, it's a mistake to say, though, I think, that the pigeon has acquired the concept of person. The concept is in the apparatus. The concept was formed when you reinforce responses to slides with people and extinguish responses with to slides without people. You, you form the concept. The remarkable thing is that pigeons can respond in that different way, but without having a concept in the head to help them. Well, is that true of people as well, then? In, in what sense? When should we apply the word concept? When, when can we say, if ever, mm -hmm. that people have concepts yeah. or that a pigeon mm -hmm. has a concept? Yeah. Well, concept is the process, is the product of conception. And uh, that is a metaphor that uh, is, is, rather, is really relevant here. Something is supposed to have happened in you for the first time. Uh, and is like all mentalistic concepts, there are environmental explanations which take over the origination of something inside. It was, it was the environment, it was the contingency, the reinforcement, which led to the behavior. And the concept is something we make up as a name for the change in us, which, as a result of which we now behave in a different way. You see, we don't store memories, we simply are changed organisms. We don't acquire concepts, we are changed organisms. The pigeon that will respond to people and not to people is a changed pigeon. And we've changed it by differentially enforced it with respect to visual presentations. It's uh, the, the, there is, of course, a change that will eventually be discovered by trained scientists a hundred years from now, perhaps, uh, when they get to that fineness of control, uh, and that I leave it to them. I, I, I believe in brain science. I don't believe in philosophy or, or concept formation. I guess I, I'm still curious to pursue thinking uh, a little more. I have two questions. Is there a difference between verbal thinking and nonverbal thinking? And is there a difference between human thinking and the thinking of other species? Well, since I have no way of knowing about the thinking of other species as something they observe, and I can, I can both observe what I do and also what I am thinking at the time, I, I'm not quite sure how that could be answered. However, I would distinguish between the way I am thinking when I am inventing a piece of apparatus as a gadget, and I, I, I do things without actually doing them, 
in the sense I almost always as visualizing the consequences of doing. I see myself putting things together in certain ways and seeing whether that's square and whether this is likely to move without hitting this and so on. And all of that is perceptual behavior, which is very hard to make people understand as behavior. That it is what I would do if I had the pieces there, and what I would see if I saw my if if I were doing it with the pieces. And I, of course, I can't do it as well without the pieces. That's why I would eventually get around to making it, making a model, to see whether it works or not. I invented a 